All right, so it looks like the recording has started, so if uh, someone down there wants to introduce Ken, we can get started. Sure. Um, this is Steve Rudy with um, the Datacom, the CA team, the Datacom team as a product owner, and this is the next in our series of the best of CTC, and I'm welcoming, welcoming you all here. Um, we look to see, it looks like there's quite a few people in attending, and um, I know that this was a big focus group during the CTC. That's why instead of being a presentation, we've gone ahead and we have made this a, um, and instead of being a focus group, this is a presentation. Most of the best of CTC has been um, replays of our presentations, but this one was so highly attended and a lot of people were very interested in it. Um, this is going to be a really quick session or really packed session. Things are going to go quickly. Um, it's not going to be a quick session over time. One of the things that, um, and I'll have um, Len go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, if we can go to the next slide um, as we work through this, please. Uh, uh, Ken has the ball right now. Okay. So, so up at the very top, there's a little triangles forward and back. Are they up to the side? No, I'll keep talking as, as we try to get to the next slide. So this is, um, we're going to cover a lot of information very quickly. The presentation is incredibly short, which is good since we seem to be having some technical difficulties with the presentation. What we're going to cover is Ken has a list of his most frequently used, very important um, Go on to the next one. Okay. Frequently used important um, commands that he uses with InfoView. And he's been walking me through it this morning. I'm just getting me more familiar with what InfoView has to offer and kind of walking through his demo. And it really highlights a lot of important information very quickly in what's going on within your MOF and different parts of, of what's going on. So the bullet points here, we're really going to go through just the, the commonly used commands. CPU loops, 24-bit um, memory leaks, and 30 as well as 31-bit I/O hangs, and next page, please. Researching the library issues in the MUF, dump commands, um, where the command usage, and other commands as time permits. And I have questions down here at the bottom. One of the things what we're asking, since this is such a full session, that as questions come up feel free to type them into the chat into the, the, the WebEx. So we'll be uh, grouping the, the questions together. And if we get a, a critical mass of questions, we'll take a pause. Ken will go ahead and answer those questions. But um, we're going to try to keep things moving. If there's questions that we don't get to at the end, we'll, Ken and I will, will work with getting answers back out to the communities to answer these questions. So it's going to be going really pretty quick. So at this time, uh, we'll just click through the rest of the, we'll have a demo. I'm doing a little legal slide here. You can click through that. And um, we'll have that as, as a part of this. And at the end, we'll give you Ken's email address if you have any questions. So we'll come back to this at the end. So at this time, I think what Ken, you need to do is share your screen. Are you seeing that? Definitely at the no. share. Bring oh. down your share. Go back to this. And quick start. Share. And what screen was that on? Or what do you want to just do that? The application keeping it. And we can see it. So I'll hand it over to Ken Eaton, a very well-known member of our Datacom team. So uh, my name is Ken Eaton. <coughs> I came to work uh, in 1987, roughly in March, 
Uh, a long time ago, I've been doing lots of things, different jobs. Uh, one of the things I do do a lot of is get to know the very really well over the years because just different roles in my job require me to gain some knowledge. So my goal today is share some of that with you today. So what we're going to do, start off with is a series of commands and uh, one of the commands I want to we need to do is start off with is DS allocate. And what we have to do before we do a command, we have to anchor on a particular multi-user. And this is the way we do that. Then we type in DS allocate as a command, hit enter, and basically what you start seeing is a list of libraries, oops, sorry, wrong key, it's paging down, you'll see all the different data sets that Muff has, and one of the things I like about this, I have to have lots of system files that bring in a multi-user, you know what members are being used here, so as I move over, you'll see I have multiple members coming in, so you know what members stuff is stuck in, so I want to look at something, look at it that way. Uh, down here, you've got your database areas. And uh, one of the things I use this for primarily is uh, you can look at your library chain here. Um, what do next is we can do data information. For example, I want to know, maybe I want to look at this guy here, DS info. And it gives me the number of extents you're in. You know, all kind of information. It's all centralized. So you can see how big it is. You can do some database areas. So if you've got database data sets and lots of extents, you can chase it this way. A simple way of looking at it. For example, let's go to another database. Uh, as well as uh, example. Maybe dictionary. So you can do one extent for it. Just a way of, different way of seeing where you're going to pick your pack. Um, well, another command I like about this that you can do, which is sometimes they're interesting about R mids, about libraries, what's in there. So what we do then is we page back up to the step line and we go down to database, which is this library right here, and we type a command called lmid. And what this will do is give you back your fixed level for all the modules in the common library. So you can look at what you have for maintenance on as a, li as a library, per se. And an example, uh, like a guy that's kind of interesting to a lot of people is this guy. You can see him by CSEC what his different fixes are all at one time, which is kind of nice to have. <coughs> Another thing I like about this command is that you do a sort command on a couple fields. So the thing called sort IO descending. Sort IO C T. Looks like I am sorry, it's the wrong place. I gotta get out of here first. Tier three. And this has a you know, move over so you can see it. You get IOs for your data set as you run work. What I'm going to do now is schedule some work so you see it going through here. So I'm going to submit this workload here. So I must get some work going. And we'll start seeing some IOs here shortly. So you see them popping in here. So if you're curious about what must be doing for IO at any given point in time, you curious if you got maybe have a bottleneck going on for one two. Some tip for 15, 20 minutes cycle, so wonder what IOs are going to. This is a simple way to see them. And you get an idea of who's getting all the IOs for your work. One of the things about SysU does very well, oops, sorry, DSL, uh, there's a whole pile of commands. You have PF1 and command over in the line, and he gives you a whole list of commands you can run. All of your, you run these any given days, you can do, you can do test NQs, uh, miscat, is the only command I just showed you. Uh, you can actually zap DASI, which is your discretion, uh, but you can you have lots of power here. Another command I use a lot is called uh, task monitor. And what this does is like a baby stroll before it, 
and defaults 10 seconds. You can override that 10 seconds even if you want to be, and if you want to see where the code's running a lot, you see this count field here? Let me get where I can see this better. So I can do a sort. Unfortunately, the uh, environment running on is running pretty heavy workloads at the moment. You do a sort, count, descending. And that tells you that's what Musk currently working in is basically IDX. He's doing most, and like I said, he runs every 10 seconds and does this. Now, if you want to change the length, now 10 seconds works for most things I do. And sometimes you may want to run a little bit longer. And the way you would do that is type in tasmon space asterisk, followed by a value up to 20, I think, let's say 20 seconds. That would now run 20 seconds. So if you want a longer polling interval for how long you want to collect values or something's running, you could hit this way. But the reason I'm here a lot is that I want to know what was, if Muff is actually looping the module. Now, one of my demonstrations when we're moving to the middle soon is how, what a CPU loop looks like on the screen. I don't know why they did that. Came back with no results. That's very strange. So what I want to do now is uh, another command I want to show you is a uh, thing called task. People are not responding. But uh, I like about this picture structure, this is just a, uh, what I call a tree structure of the buff. If I hit the right clip to you. Starting here, there's a tree structure for multi user in all these task areas. Normally I run a dynamic terminal, but unfortunately, if I do a dynamic terminal, you guys can't see it, so I'm paging left and right and all around. Unfortunately, you can't see it anything better. But if you can do a dynamic terminal intersection, you can see this all together. But over here, you're going to see a PS, some PSWs and run times. You can see what's going on in terms of what different tasks are being multi user. If, one, if a subtask dies in MUF, this is the place you're going to see it because MUF may run the subtask that dies. And that, it could run that way for, for a long, long time. So if you wonder why something's not running, a piece of something's not running right, this way you can look at this panel and see if a subtask died. <clears throat> also, what it also gives you is a PSW, so if you do have a problem and a picker module pops up, you can get the offset and the module name to help you with information with your, for a picker problem, if a module's having a problem. Um, so let's move into a uh, actual case here. Let's start a... Now, what code I have here is something we don't want to give you ever. Call it drive, drive the CPU loop. We do I. We got code to test IO hangs and memory exhaust 24 and 31 bit. Uh, hopefully, you'll never see these problems. But for the purpose of demo here, I want to show you what it looks like if you do have a particular problem. So what I want to do now is drive this down. And what we want to do next is test mod. Wait in 10 seconds. And we want to do a sort to uncount descending. And right now, that looks suspiciously high, that percentage does. So we'll let go again. And every, ta every CPU that MUP uses, you can have a different CPU burning in multi users. So right now it looks like we're looping. You see how small the screen's gotten and past the end moved up? We have a single event looping log at two offsets. It's a really tiny loop. And what you would do for us, if you see this problem, is you need to do a screen capture a couple times to gather documentation or support and can't you issue an SEC dump when you, when you detect this. So we have some documentation to trace. So in order to clear this out, 
Now, to show you on the multi U file. As you can see here, without doing the IOs, the multi U is basically burning the over by the burning a processor. When the machine lets in, you see the machine's pretty busy, it's 100%. That's not what a CPU loop would look like to, uh, to assist you on a data column. So I'm going to cancel him and restart that up. Start here. See what restart doing. Walker is pushing out the uh, to restart DD card as he runs through stuff. And all the demos I've done, this never runs as well. But today, of course. Looks like they might be done. So next thing I want to show you is a memory leak. I will look to Datacom. So what I want to do now is going to see an example I exhaust 24-bit memory. And what we want to show you is the command to do to see memory in Datacom is private. We need the anchor on the muff, DSMG muff one. And in this case, this is what MUF looks like. The unallocated is what we haven't used. And we have the use, and we have the percentages over here at high watermark. And what we're going to get, the bottom part is 24 bit. And the users of the storage we're going to use to consume. And if you run out 24 bit, that's probably the worst possible thing you can do. And 31 bits up here. And uh, we'll talk about 64 bit later, but for the time being, we'll stay with 31 and 24. So let me uh, get this started so we can run through the uh, case of showing this memory growing. So once that job starts, we should start seeing the numbers climb over here at a high watermark in the use, and you should get smaller on the unallocated side. And we're going through storage. And uh, but what you would do in your case is you'd want not want the unallocated to a tiny number. And if it does, I would almost tell you to be safe to bring your muff down before you exhaust the storage because IBM is not very kind when you're going to exhaust memory. So I'm going to start the 31. This is what it looks like for 24. So I'm going to start the 31 now, exhaust in. Job starts. Looks like he's going by now. In this particular environment, I only get one point. This is the max I get in this particular box. A lot of your clients will probably have two gig here. We only have one because we have a lot of people wanting to use ECSA. Not Dedicom, but other serious products because there are so many products around this machine. So you can see it climbing now. Well, who runs out first, 31 or 24? It's a 
with him down in 24. <clears throat> so that's a trend you would see when you're trying to see what's going. Uh, it looks like from this viewpoint. So I think I go ahead and kill them off for a end up adding in the multi either. So let me do that. Kyle Haynes is next. So let's talk let's do that one. There's cases where, uh, let me show you, let me start the IO work again. Let me get that going. It's in a couple of these. So, what we want to go back to is DS allocate. And sort IOCT, IOCT. Descending. We want to push over to the right till we see it. So we see we got lots of IO going on. So what we want to do now is we're going to interrupt that where we actually hang one. And I've got again special code that does that, which you should never see. Hopefully. So we're going to do that now. And the IO rate should stop. So we're going to do some DC tasks also to show that the IO hang. It must show the IO rate somewhere eventually. These IOs will start slowing down, hopefully. So we'll do a DC task if we're IO weights. I don't see any weights yet. Wait, I all day. There we go. Well, we did good. We did hang them up. We have lots of them. Now, we have some code, only some code we're working on, for debugging purposes, to make them go. This may not. It makes the individual ones go. Just an hour. So we'll try that and see what it does. So let's go back. And it looks like it didn't have 100% success. So let me look at something quickly. And it looks like it forced two of the IOs to go. It spared them off and then continued. So, so that's what it looks. Uh, I want to clear this out. I'm about to kill the multi user because it's just there's no way to. I can't spin up these fast enough to clear them out. I'd rather take more time. So let me do a. Uh, uh, yes, I'm not sure what it looks like over here now, where everything hanging up. As you can see, our IO rates. Look it over here. I've gone to Z, uh, sort IO RT descending. Basically, the whole mop is hung now, it's dead in the water. So, what we want to do now. Kill them up again. And we'll let that come down and restart it.
The next subject we'll move on to is library change. It's always seems to be interesting challenges for, for most of us at different times how to see if we're running the right code. But uh, we can move on to that now. We'll have to wait for the muff come up, so let's go ahead and do that. So what we want to do next is do re anchor back on the muff and start cycling. Trying to do a DD list step line. It's command to get to a DD card. There's a library. And then I can type in uh, where DD MFS PR. Wrong mods, I'm sorry. Where DVI must be. I'll pick a different one. So he's in this library here. And I can go browse him. And I, he'll pull up the mod and look at the R and then see what he is. So that's, that's a way to check library chains, see what you have in your libraries, what the library chain has. And it doesn't mean Muff is running that. If I bring Muff up and I copy a module into a library, doesn't mean that module is executing. So to see that, you need to do a dump command. Let me get out of this first. You do a dump DBIDSPR. This is what you run me. The other one is what's in the library. The army may or may not be the same. If you copy the module after you brought them up, up it may not be running. The new copy may or may not be running. The new copy may not have done what you wanted. Certain models are new copyable. So if you're always wondering what's running, dump command is the surest way to find out. If your shop does not copy code to libraries with a muff up, then the library chain search will be more than satisfactory. Um, one more command I want to show you here. If you like D list, we showed you earlier. Step line. Another way to get that is called task line. Same command. It's a different way of getting to it. Sometimes it's easy to do a task line and not worry about the duty name. Beware defaults a step line. And CICS, that won't work exactly right because you use the FHRPL. So you have to use the list. So it's your library chain. So again, be careful what you Make sure you search library chain and you realize you're actually in that code. If there's any copying, you may not. Give the results you expect it to give. Dumb commands. Go back to that. There's tons and tons of options on dump. And the PF1 key I'm hitting, no key, I mean, there's just a lot here. This is not very friendly because I can't do it down in the terminal, but there's all kinds of different commands, different ways you can chase stuff. You can, we can chase stuff in character form, uppercase, lowercase. ASCII, uh, hexadecimal, you can look for strings on different boundaries, full word, half word, double word, whatever you want to do. Uh, well, also it has the power of zapping. So if your site does not secure this, you might have some, it'd be interesting to problem for you, but uh, you can actually zap storage and do what you want with it. So anyway. There's a lot of stuff in dump command to chase if you want to do that. Uh, you can uh, sometimes another problem customers do, which I don't know we have, but sometimes customers like putting code in linked list. One of the first questions that came in March of eighty seven was we have Datacom libraries on the link list. Two months ago I got the same question. So I we do not want your link list, but Somehow people put it there, and we don't know what library you're in. So if you're looking for a link list, you want to know where the library is, you need the where command. You be, in this case, I want you to find something. So I'm going to use this module, which is only in 12 or lower. And that's because I don't have access to one library. It's just a library to let me in, but it doesn't have to quote me. So I got a place. I found DBSCC three places in this library. I would never guess 100 years over there. So you can see what they call. You can see they're very old guys. But if you have a, a copy of a module, you're having trouble trying to find out why it's being picked up. 
This is a great way to go search a linked list for a specific module. And some of the common API modules on the application side, some people put in here by themselves, like IMF and INR. And this is how you go find them. Another place people put them is the LPA list. Some people put an LPA, let me get out of here. Some people put some common modules because you see a lot of loads, like for INR, for INF, they put an LPA, trying to save on loads. And they wonder why a private copy of INR is being loaded, and they, they put the fix on, but they can't find it. So you do LPA list, type in where, DB, INR, I won't have it in this case, but if you found it, it would be the library it was in. And I can't tell you how many times I've been chasing INR someplace and didn't know where it was. Because they somehow they want to build a PPC entry and want to make it keep doing loads on it. So I don't know. There's some sites to do that. Not recommended though. <clears throat> um, next series of commands I want to talk a little bit about is start your environment. Sometimes you just don't know what the clock looks like or something's changed. The sysu status command gives you wonderful information about the entire uh, physical environment. It will give you machine, the involves the serial numbers on the processors. It tells you everything you want to know about the physical hardware itself. It tells you what releases of uh, operation you run. You get the IPL information you want, IPL stats. You can get all that stuff there. It's really kind of a really cool command that gives a ton of information. It tells you different releases, different parts that IBM has. Different things installed. It's just a just a great general command to run if you don't if you're looking at what release of stuff is. Okay. And sometimes we want to know how the box is carved up. There's a wonderful command called park info. This describes the physical footprint. This particular box has 31 processors. And it tells you how busy the physical hardware is. It tells you all the different ways it's carved up. And if we go down, you'll see more LPARs. You've got the couplers here, too, also. Part info. It's all one word. And this tells you how the hardware's carved up. So if someone doesn't understand the environment, this command I ask them to run and print it off and send it to me. Or run batch this view will actually give me a batch print, too. So it tells me what the, how the environment's carved. And out further to the, to the uh, left, you're going to see more information about the different, how much memory is allocated to it. So this gives a lot of useful information when you start working performance issues. And when something doesn't run quite right and you wonder why it maybe doesn't have the horsepower or whatever it is. Anyway, it's, it's a place to start if you don't know your environment. I find it very awesome, very good information. Um, Another command I like a lot is called space. You see in QAS. These are the first five letters of volumes we use. And this gives you a nice little report of all the volumes, how much space you're using, the largest amount of free space, tracks, and stuff like that. So this is a really cool command. For how, if you have some of all series naming standards for it, you can come through and quickly see find what's on what, how uh, what's being used. Whoops, wrong P. And uh, so that's a command I use a lot. Another command I use for environment is called delay. This is a performance command in SysView. It tells you what type of delays are on the box. And this job down here, CHR M3JL CPU, it says it's waiting 66% of the time for a processor to be available. So it wants something else that's taking the processor away from it. So this is a cool command to try to figure out what's wrong in the box. And if you're looking for offending jobs that are related to it, you page over, it gives you a list of those. And you'll see I'm in the list. <laughs> There's one offending jobs taken processor. More than one place. So if you're looking for stuff, you're looking for problems, this is a place to start. Delay is a wonderful command. Log it. If you're looking for problems and just want to know what's going on in the box sometimes, this is a place to look at for other things that may be outside your, your problem, your product, 
but it may tell you what else is going on at the time you had the problem. So I run this sometimes just to see what's going on. And there's, you know, there's tons of, this is an issue for to go look at other things that may be offending on the LPAR that may be related to your problem. It may not be related to your problem. We don't know. And you have ability to control slips. You can add them, detract them, you know, what you want to do. Slip commands got tons of uh, options. Again, whoops, wrong key. You can uh, pick a slip command. You can select, delete, disable, enable. So you have lots of ways you can do your slips, manage your slips this way. Another command that's in for support sometimes. Sometimes we get dumps that are incomplete, don't have the right options turned on, so you want to know what they are. This tells you what the different options are on the LPAR is for your different dumps. When support calls up, so if you need a complete dump, this will verify what you're running. So you have all the options turned on that's recommended by us or IBM or CA, whoever you want. So that's a way you can see what's being dumped. Um, next command is going to be, let's talk about. Can you dig down further into that and see if there's options? No, it's just displays. One more thing I want to show you. Um, there's a command in here that sometimes you have a task that just won't go away. You can cancel him, cancel him, cancel him, you won't go away. You purge him, you won't go away. You can do a force, you won't go away. On the box, there's a command called AS kill. You will make it go away. But you get no dot, no nothing, you will terminate the task. I don't know what it leaves. I, I, I do not know what shape the ACES left in, if it's still valid or not. I have not had any problems telling them to call back the same ACES. So in the past, there's been history of when you kill something off wrongly or in a way this way, it doesn't allow it to be reused in a way that's nice. But generally, I've not seen that problem in a long time. In the past, that was a major problem. You kill something off wrong, and I didn't, didn't clean up right, you fell back into it. All of a sudden, your job had problems you've never seen before. And you don't know why. Well, if somebody did this, and you fell back in that ACID, you're inheriting problems presented maybe three or four jobs ago. You just don't know. So you can use this command, but you need to be very careful when you use it. And I'd make sure if somebody else knows it, if it's this problem, you know you did that. If you've been permitted to do that. And we never have jobs home here, so we don't ever have to use it. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about, let's see, I want to get into some journalists. Okay, sis, you, huh? Oh, yeah. Thank you. That would be a good idea. That's a good suggestion. <laughs> well, next thing I want to talk about. This view's got help screens. We've got wonderful, great help ways to get stuff. A lot of docs almost online. You can do topics. And you can be here and do find. We're looking for something here, to find something you can find what you're looking for. So it's got tons and tons and tons of stuff. Commands. Another way of finding. Type in the command. You can just paste through these and just play with them. It gives you syntax. You want to look at something, you know, like this guy right here. That's what? You can look in the running now. So, let me hit that. And you can use the format to. Uh, so, you know, you're going to see that. So, there's tons and tons of stuff in here. Uh, help. Uh, there's tons of good. I think there's just tons of good help in SysView. One of the things I like about SysView, also, let me go back to the menu here is they have a uh, thing called dashboards that recently put in place for different products. So I'm going to go to Datacom's, uh, let me go products, I think I want to go 16, let's go to, oh, let's go to 9 first. This will give you all the CA software that this you can find and tell you the releases you have installed. And you'll see we have or release of Datacom, still on this box. So it gives you this kind, of good, kind of interesting information on the final list out there. 11. 
Okay, that's not a good tool. Oh, that's not it. Let me go show you the dashboard. I'll show you what's on fire. And let's go to settings I got. Dashboards are something you can customize and shop and make it anything you want. Because my trauma is a mod too, you can't see it very well, but you can have multiple panels going, section of trauma. If you have a trauma not being busy, you got nothing you want to sit there and watch stuff, this will do this all day long. And you can set your interval at different times, how often you want to refresh it, different refresh rates, each of the different subsections you have subsections you have and different scrolling amounts. And turn it on. And there's lots of examples out there how to do that. Whoops, let me try to see. And uh, so this is tons of different stuff you can see out here for dashboards. And this totally is out here sample to see is done. Some for history properties and data comms flavor. Uh, there's a whole, you can do lots of stuff on this. Uh, you can customize, like I said, different, different way. And if you want to change the interval on what you do, you just type in update, space 30. Every 30 seconds, your dashboard will start changing. You mm -hmm. press and sit there and run to the cows come home. Every 30 seconds. They just keep running. Your terminal has to be refreshed every 30 seconds. If you have a terminal, you want to type like that. I think. Another command I want to show you is Kyrim. Kyrim is uh, what you use Kyrim for. This gives you an example, an example of what you ran Kyrim with, uh, how you use it in your shop. So you can see it here. At the bottom, you'll see the uh, 14 15. We do for that. So it's kind of, if you want to know what Chiron is installing, that kind of stuff, it's a, a cool command to do that. I'm actually making better progress than I thought you were making. <laughs> so, what else I think? Things I want to cover through the other, I want to walk through all the data comm commands. You want to go through those? Okay. Yeah. yeah, we don't have any questions so far. Okay. Um, so you want to go through the DataCom menu, right? Right. So i got to run back to see. Let me get some more schedule. On the dashboard, it says something about request. Yes. Let me get back to that in one second. Let me get this going. So you can, this is showing your, because I got so few bases, everything's in storage, it's just, it's just using this list, and they're just running through it. It's not showing much here because I don't have my, I don't have my duration, my data because my buffer's too large, Kevin. So it's not going to show anything. I don't have a, too many buffers. SQL Server's applying, doesn't really show much. I'll do DC task and DC list. And Let me tell you that. <coughs> Start out with DC list. So up to the right. So that'll be okay. Here's the we have on the box. Elfar. You see, we have uh, a couple of them. And you anchor on one of these and select it. And for example, this is the one I'm anchored on now. The AC command. Another one anchor course is putting this. Just select it here, and you might get you ready to put in your list. And you can do a DC cast to see your work is going to multi user. And I think. Thing I have to pay attention to a lot is the duration time. When duration time starts climbing, I need to really start worrying about it. But let's get to you know 10, 15, 20 seconds. I don't really. You do a duration sort down. Yes, you do that, or about TSN also too. The different duration. My stuff's not running fast enough. Slow enough. <laughs> Bad parts run too fast. <laughs> But they're all running in less than a second. So unless the race hits a second, it's not going to see it. But you see it's all being scheduled for any uh, There's another duration, I thought, TSM duration. I don't see it. Induction time. Trend time. Back to the right there. Back to the right? No. 
there you go up there. See, see, that's another one you pay attention to. See which ones are running low. Yeah. So that's, that's a reason for this. Oops, I'll keep. Um, what else we want to look at? Uh, S&P tasks. Let's look at eight. You see we're burning one processor, sometimes we get to two. Different works running. So you an idea of what methods that pick them up and is using. Uh, number nine gives me a global view. Looks like CBS is not working very well, Kevin. So I know. I forgot. Uh, DC rates. I lie here. Just tells you what he's working on. I mean, he's not. Let's go to the let's go to the uh, directory table. That could be made more some interesting stuff here. Six. Uh, well, once I look, for example, if you look, if you're a uh, CDC person, and you want to know what's going on, sometimes you have this DC table. Uh, 2009, and you got row counts. You can watch it climb, get bigger or smaller, and watch it going. It's, I use this a lot when I'm doing CDC to see if I'm how far behind and getting further and further behind or, or catching up. Currently, I'm, this month doesn't use CDC, but if I had CDC, these row counts were going up and down, back and forth. If stuff came off, it would go down. So I use a lot how to track CDC, this command. So the table has data coming in and out. So, uh, DC table 781. And just got row activity. Just, so, I use it. If you're looking to want to monitor table for a picker base, this is what I do anyway to monitor picker base. Sometimes you want to know. What else do you want to look at? Basics. DC, default. 71. It gives you an idea how full they are. This way. Of course, it's, you know. But you don't know how much I.O. is going on. This is what's going on here. Um, Restaurant, okay. Tables, okay. Items, man. DC directory. This is a cool thing to look at sometimes. You don't know what's turned on in CSS. It gives you all that. And, uh, when this has six bucks turned off, Kevin, just to be enough. You can tell the simple file what you want to do here. Well, if you go to like areas, you can show your block size and sort by block size. Sure, DC areas, DC areas, seven eighty one. Actually, be seven eighty two. more areas. I was actually going to. Okay, what you could do is you could sort by block size to see all of the different block sizes you're using for your data sizes to see how that maps out to the number of buffers you have. A uh, certain specific shop you might, in this specific month, you may not have a lot of block sizes, but a lot of our sites are going to larger block sizes. There's a way of comparing the list at least by minute to see what you have in each uh, block size because that depends on what buffers are being used to service which block size. I was looking at the blocks, I don't see it. It may be on the um is it on the volumes? Yes, that's on I think it's in over there on data sets. Data sets. It's not here, you have to do a join. The one interesting counter is mood rows. I mean, I while we're here I want to talk a little bit about what that is. Those are just those cause just different kind of those, those are sometimes interesting logging but for special cases, but I don't. Let's go back over here. So you want to look at benefits now? 
Well, I mean, from the concept of just discovering what what's using for what block size. So with different screens, people need to go through and figure out what information is there because there's a lot of really good information. And as you are looking at this from a DBA, most of the work you used to do with the CXX report, you can do online with this directory feature. The things you used to always look at, you can go out and scan right here very easily. Where's your blocks? So if you sort by block size pending, you can determine which, uh, so you have an area of 32K, so you yep. have at least one buffer with 32K size. Lots of areas of 27, 998, which is a good 3390 size. And as you page down, what you can determine here, if you look at the percentage of activity, how much of the activity is occurring on these different block sizes, and that would give you an idea as to how many buffers you need each size. Okay. And that's one of the reasons you want to look out there and try to balance performance in the map. If you're seeing that um, your data buffers for 4K are being overrun, you know, you're getting a lot of really demand on them and you're not getting very much reuse, you can use this to go out and find out what data sets are running in 4K and which are the busiest data sets dynamically. Right. You could do this with the CXX report and PXX statistics and other things, but you have an opportunity here to look at this online because a lot of times you can't bring your muff down or other cases, but you can't do research around those areas. You can also, there's a, uh, the muff options where you can actually go out and see what the current muff options are. Make sure that uh, someone hasn't changed an option you're not aware of. Sometimes that does happen. Um, and you, know, you want to see what options are currently turning on in this month. So if you're managing 10 or 15 different multi users and you are trying to think what did this multi user come up with, you can easily see at the current time that you're looking what the parameter is because you may have a someone working with you who has changed some of these parameters. So you have capabilities to go in there and look at what your MUF startup is. So there's a lot of information here about how the MUF gets started up, what its current uh, buffer pools are, um, all the different information about how the system is running. Um, accounting um, typically is not a big deal, but if you're looking at your statistics and you suddenly see accounting is taking up 2% of your MUF, you may want to go over to the accounting page and see which accounting table you're collecting all the data on. Um, that information is in here. Um, so here you're looking at through all the MUF parameter startups so you can kind of validate, oh yeah, I did change that parameter. I issued a flex pole parameter and added 6,000 flex pole buffers in. That's where those buffers are. There's lots you can do with this screen here um, just to, to validate how your MUF is running. And if you go back to your other options here, if you look at accounting, as I said earlier, if, if you're seeing accounting is taking up a large amount of your information, you can look at the accounting parameters just to see what accounting tables are busy. Um, that gives you an option to, to go out and see. Uh, in this case, you only had one accounting table to find these closed, so obviously your accounting is not taking up. But you have that ability to see how much load is out here. So if you've got a, uh, a parameter or you look at your most statistics and it said the accounting is bad, you can go find that out. You can look at your buffer pools. So if you're using multiple buffer pools, you can look at your config operations, you can look at your memory resident data. So this just basically shows you the different buffer pools that you've defined. In this case, Ken is using the extended buffer pool capabilities of Datacom. You've created additional buffer pools. You can actually go out and determine which database is over which buffer pool. Now remember, that's something that you can either find at multi-user startup, but you can change through commands. And it's very, you know, again, if you see a specific buffer pool being overrun, it gives you a capability to go out and see. You could do a sort by pool and see which um, databases are in which pools. So it'll help you define that. Uh, to go back to the back screen here, we. MRDF is very important. You can see what you're currently covering and what the response is on the cover data sets. So this is what you have covered. And you can see out to the far right there how many uh, reads and writes have been saved by the covering. 
and it helps you to figure out whether or not, again, you're not doing a very good job. You only saved a few reads, Kent. The bases are, you know, <laughs> but, uh, the bases are running, it's not in here. Yeah, so the, so it gives you an opportunity to look at your, actively look at your cover. And so SysView is a great tool from the perspective that as a systems programmer, you can start at the very top and take the multi-user address space apart and look and see what's happening. Are you running out of storage? What things are you running? See all the different things. But then also, it's a great tool from the perspective that maybe the multi-user address space is running and you're not really running out of storage or anything like that. You're not really concerned with that. But you are concerned about what processing is running. Because you look like you're pretty busy and there's lots of tasks running, but which task is really pulling down all the work? So you have the capability with this few datacom menu to go out there and actually take apart and look at some of the datacom menu. Things like uh, oh, it's turned off this month. Yeah, the zip off on the machine. The zip on on this month. Now, um, DC system is, is really the one that uh, tab nine there. That doesn't work. CBS. Oh, no, no, that one there works. No, CBS. Yeah, CBS is not there, but the other things are here, which will give you statistics about how many database requests you're running, you get going up and down. You can see your read-write ratio over there. Uh, you can see a lot of information on index queues, log writes. So there's lots of information here that you can use. Um, you need to patch on to fix the CBS part. But um, it gives you that ability to look into the system. So again, SysU starts out as a very large product that you can do the systems programmer and the, and the main line things you're looking for. And there's some really cool things like being able to go out and look at the individual libraries that the MUF got started with. You don't have to try to figure out from the JCL, so you can actually walk through all that data set um, and library management we did. But it also allows you to drill down and just basically look at a given MUF and see what's happening there right now. Anytime someone calls me and says, my MUF is up and running, but boy, I'm not real. I'm not real sure what's going on. The very first thing I do is have them do a DC task and show me the tasks are out there. Is there something looping? Something hanging? Something going in circles? I don't know. Everything looks like it's running really well. Well, if everything's running really well, then is there a certain resource that we're really using a lot of? So I'll go out and look at the areas and see, you know, what are the heaviest used areas? Is the log area suddenly 50% of the I/O activity? Is there something going on? That I'm not understanding. Um, so you have the capability of drilling down in and asking questions real time while the muff is up without interrupting the system. And the big difference between this interface and something like AutoInfo, which also displays all this data, is because it's an interactive interface, you can just basically keep hitting the enter key and seeing how the display changes and seeing if something goes up or down where if you're doing a comm status, you know, and you're submitting them online, it's how fast can you type? Where with this, you can basically just do DC tasks and keep hitting the enter key and see if the task that's eating the multi-user right now, if it's changing, right? Because if it's changing, then it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's passing work back and forth. But if you have a single task that is sitting there running through at all times, you have that capability with, with the, the DC task command to just sit there and watch it run. So it's sort of an end-to-end -end product. So we're looking at SysView with Datacom as being a product that could really provide you that whole end-to-end -end kind of uh, view. We do have a question from the attendees. Mm -hmm. The question is, can you watch a load or a backward recovery? Yes, if it runs long enough, you can watch it real time. You can just, always, as long as the job can stay active on the environment, you can anchor to an ACID command and anchor on him, you can watch him run as long as you want to watch him run in real time. Okay. So if it runs in 20, 30 seconds, I'm not a good candidate. If it runs three or four hours, sure. Uh, I forgot to cover his NQ command. Uh, in DS allocate, there's a thing called NQ command. I'll go back and do this again. And what we do is we do an NQ, and sometimes you want to know if it's local or not. In this case, the word systems, this is IBM's nomenclature. Scope is system. That means it's local. If it's systems, an S means it's global or sysquat. So you have an S or no S. <laughs> that's all you get. So in this picture, MUF, I'm running local only. And then if you want to know how MUF 
into on the uh, queue name, you can do comma comma C A D T C by the type of C N zero two. That's the uh, key name we use. Not last of the key name we use. And he will give you what he is. And this D C A D C C M this name is documented D V A manual. And you wanna know what he's doing. If he's system or systems uh, he's still system because here, but I happen to know that MIM, if I go to MIM, what if I call MIM? He can override this. If I walk through the MIM menu, you can see where he's changed it to systems. So in our shop, how we code NQs for CXX, we can never code a local one and make it work local. Because MIM owns over these systems. So you know it says what it says here doesn't mean it really what it's doing. If you have a part like MIM, he can override the NQ mechanism. And the reason NQ is important, that's how you protect data sets between DB utility and multi-user, because you have single user functions versus multi-user functions. But sometimes you want access to a data set that happens to be shared, in a sense, because one wants it one time, one wants it next time. And this queue name and this lock system is how it's managed. Uh, sometimes some, some, you'll see a 67 if there's a problem. Any other questions? Not at this time. Well, I hope everyone felt that uh, they learned something in the presentation. As Ken um, alluded to here earlier, you can ask us questions. Uh, uh, you can ask Ken questions at ken.eaton at ca.com or uh, Sue Broody here or Kevin Schuma. We'll be glad to get an answer to your questions. As we started out with the presentation, the, the, the SysView interface is really the real-time interface into the datacom environment. And we feel it's a really strong tool for our DBAs and sysprogs to have in basically monitoring, measuring, and debugging the datacom environments. Thank you all for your attendance today. And with this, Len, I'll ask you to go ahead and close off the recording. All right, thanks very much, guys. Have a good day.